So you should get a little notice come up uh, if you can just press, I think the, it says got it uh, on there. Uh, and then I think we are, we're live and we're recording. And I will hand over to the wonderful Jane Boston. Scott, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all of you for turning up and coming to show an interest about boys studies at Central. It's, it's really great to see you. Um, I'm based, um, I've been at Central for, for some time. Um, at the moment, I'm actually working at home and um, in Brighton. So I've still got a little bit of glimpse of sunset going on here uh, down in Brighton. So I'm, I'm really lucky to, to have this moment to see the sky, the sky and to see you all. So listen, it's great to see you. I, I just want to give you as much or as little of you li as you like um, of, of an introduction. I mean, if, if I give you an introduction, then you surely have some questions in relation to what I'm saying. But I couldn't underline it more that coming to voice studies at this time at Central is a pretty exciting moment. Not only have we got an amazing um, new principle, but we are in the process of completely the decentering, um, whiteness, decolonizing, looking to inclusive practice, really shaking up um, the way voice studies is um, going to come out into the world um, based on the very right principles and the very extraordinary things that are going on in, in, in the world today. Ecology, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, inclusivity at all levels, and we pride that at Central and this is really what voice studies if it does anything it really brings at the core um, people's identity their belonging and communication with the world and voice is key to that uh, digitally and live so we're buzzing I would say with excitement it's not that there's a done deal or that we're going to get it all right but that we're opening up the questions we're opening up the opportunities we're opening up um, practices we're opening up the ways in which we log our experience as part of this process of what is voice. Uh, voice in theatre, voice in performance, voice in training, voice in education, voice in business. You know, it's about something that crosses all of, all of living, all of the communicative arts and all of being. So I suppose the important thing about coming to Central is it gives you an opportunity to think about this. Um, what does it mean for you? And you are the important person in all this, each one of you. You bring yourself, your skills, your previous experience and your hopes and dreams and where you come in your community, your various communities, your family communities, your um, school communities, collegial communities, the communities you identify with sonically. Um, where do you draw your spirit from, your enthusiasm, your life skills? Where do you identify? And these are important parts of shifting what it is to be an educator uh, in a place like Central. Um, I come with a lot of experience. <laughs> it doesn't mean I've got all the knowledge. Um, what I've been doing for many years is just um, filtering, experiencing, channeling, codifying, thinking about this subject. And just as I was a student on this course many years ago, and I'm still here, so there's obviously something going on at Central that's <laughs> keeping, me, keeping me engaged. And I would say um, I'm just proud of what Central's doing and, and what my colleagues are doing and what, what most of all our students are doing. So if this sounds like it's any near, anywhere near your bag, you're in the right, you're in the right frame. Um, uh, you might want to know exactly what it is and perhaps we can take those very specific questions, but um, I'm wondering if that to kick things off gives you enough of a, of a place to think, oh, can I ask a specific question that might have relevance to whether or not you pursue uh, us any further or whether you'd like me to hear, you'd like to hear me talk about other things. But I've, I've sort of given you the, the bit that excites me, the, the bit that my leadership leads me to speak to. And, um, and of course, it's an MA. It's, a, it's an educational qualification. It's not just a set of principles that we all sign up to. It's actually a qualification. So we, we can't forget that and the importance of qualifications, of course, um, in this day and age in terms of where you want to place your career, where you want to develop. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it's that and more. Um, so really, having said that, um, do you want to let me know um, what you'd specifically like to know about an MA or MFA in voice studies at Central that you don't already know, because presumably you're here to hear and to find out. So I think that's what I'm going to do. Scott, you've got... Um... Well, I think you just touched on a, a really in interesting point, the, the difference between the MA and the MFA. And, yeah, sure. and in a way, what 
what might lead someone to choose one over the other, I guess? Brilliant question and, and much more about brass tacks than my big, you know, big talk. <laughs> but MFA at Central at the moment means it's a longitudinal um, experience. It gives you longer to do, to get a similar credit rating um, and embed your studies um, in independent work in the second year. And we were particularly asked to bring this on board for North American students for whom an MFA <clears throat> is a requirement if you want to work in higher education drama schools within the United States. So my students who graduated prior to 2010 said, Jane, can you make it an MFA? Because it gives us our career credentials in order to move forwards uh, with a terminal degree in the arts. So MFA is pertinent to United States and Australia. It's also pertinent to us in the UK because it gives you the opportunity to have a longer time to do um, your dissertation or your research work uh, and to, to embed your teaching or your coaching work. So a longer opportunity, a little bit more money you've got to pay for that but many students opt for it because it, it takes the pressure off um, what is a very intense MA, <laughs> a four term, up, you know, bang, bang, bang. It's, it's pretty intense. So for some, it's a great option. I don't know if that helps, but um, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Great question. So I'm really happy to take very specific questions and specific questions will probably help other people discover what they, they needed to know. Um, so please let me know. Yeah, Joanna, I think I'm. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hi. can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, yes. Hi, I actually came to um, an open day of yours maybe two years ago or something. Okay. Um, yes, so it's taken me a while to work out what I want to do. Um, so I have two questions, but they're very different. So I can always save the other one till after mm. other people have asked one. Um, uh, so I've been thinking about voice for a long time, about voice studies. Um, recently, I've just started to also wonder about speech therapy, and so I wondered if there is any overlap at all, because I know you can study voice within speech therapy, but I wonder if there's any overlap within voice. <laughs> I'm trying to work out where my main passions lie. No, it's a brilliant question, Joanna, and what happens is we often take people oh. who... Yeah. Yeah? Sorry, the sound disappeared for a second, but I can hear you now. Okay, great. Yeah, we often take... Um, students who have actually done speech and language therapy as um, a training and then as a career path and come to us because sometimes there's a limitation in terms of the strategies you can use within a clinical setting um, mm. because they're codified by medicine and social and certain practices whereas in the arts we can um, be, and we're in studios and we're basing ourselves on a lot of the practices in actor training which are creative imaginative uh, embodied you know so a lot of those things those terms actually don't appear in a lot of ways in clinical practice so though both relate hugely the career opportunities in voice studies give you a uh, many more strategies to work with the individual but I uh, you know neither one nor the other is um is is better or worse one of them really sets you in a particular pathway which is much more referencing to medical practice medical science and therapy and here voice studies alludes to and uses that information but it gives you the qualifications to work in the arts and I think and that it, yeah yeah and in terms of career after a voice MA yeah. could you potentially find yourself working with for example children with special needs with coming from voice or would that be unlikely very unlikely because you mm -hmm. wouldn't have the qualifications in order to give you that credibility yeah. um and so it's probably best to do it the other way around to, to, to mm. get your sort of qualification first and then realize actually you'd love to diversify you'd love to work with different client groups mm. um, and that's an excellent um somebody graduated about three years ago two two three years ago amazing um because she had the very precise knowledge that speech and language training gives you about mm. sounds and about um therapeutic practices with client groups and then came on to the MA in which you work here at Central in which you can work with actors work with creative processes that are time honored if you like and, and also being challenged at the moment and together that gave her a huge portfolio and she's just not looked back in terms of work yeah that makes sense thank just you one final thing to tell you all that 
we used to have speech therapy actually at Central many years ago. We had educate, you could train to be an educator. Uh, in drama, you could train to be a speech therapist and you could train to be an actor. And those were the sort of core subjects that Central had clustered around at the beginning, as well as um, theater, design and art. And as the years went by, some of that splintered off and speech therapy literally splintered off the building shut and they moved somewhere else. But the, the, the spirit of it, the spirit of using that knowledge and being au fait with it is really still very uh, live and kicking on voice studies. And we always used to say it's very helpful to know a friendly speech therapist if you're coaching um, out in theatre because you're, you're listening out for voices that perhaps you recognise are not functioning as they ought to, but you're not qualified to be the diagnostic physician, in, you know, finally on that. So, yeah. Thank you. I hope that helps. Thanks, Joanna. Yeah, Elizabeth. Could you unmute? Thanks. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I I don't really know. I know I want to do an MA. Yeah. I trained as an actor at Central. Okay. Uh, and Which course did you do, Elizabeth? I did BA Honours Acting Collaborative and Devised Theatre. Uh-huh. Um, and I am wanting to return to education, to academics. Um, and I'm struggling to know whether I want to study uh, movement directing or voice. And for me, I guess I want to know how much of the voice studies work is in, is embodied. I mean, voice as an actor is embodied, but I, I guess I want to know is is there kind of a slight crossover? I I, I don't. I think I'm I'm much more drawn to voice and always have been as an actor and to text work and to poetry and those kind of things. Yeah. Um, but because I'm an actor that is so used to being in my body, working in my body, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a movement based actor. Yeah, I, I, I kind of want to get a grasp on how much um, of the voice work is, is sort of centered in, in the body really. And how much is sort of phonetics. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant question. And it might be really helpful for everybody if in my answer, because it gives a flavor of the learning um, styles on the course and what it feels like to run through this program. Is it embodied? Yes, it is. And I think because it's close to the heart of actor training, we've kept a lot of the ingredients such as Alexander technique and the practice known as the link later um, voice progression, which you'll probably recognize it is. Yeah, yeah. um, and, and so there are and uh, and or other influences to Catherine Fritz Morris, which is wholly embodied. <laughs> so there are many, many um, constellations that include being in a studio, being in your body, being in your breath and um, coming to an understanding of what voice is. But it is also important to say it's a complex course because you do bounce around from being in a studio, being on your back and being in your body to then sitting on, <laughs> sitting on a desk, sitting on your chair and um, experiencing phonetics, which is a very different part of the brain. And not everybody um, knows how to manage that abstraction of, you know, codif codifying um, sounds through these strange figurations of signs. But there always is a physical way through. I mean, we know that a lot of people who come on voice um, studies are not necessarily that kind of learner that has that part of the brain <laughs> to the fore. Um, and that we will use many approaches to help you do that. But it is part of the course because one strand of, of career application is being an uh, accent and dialect coach. And there are many ways to do that. It, we're not a linguist intellectual course nor cognitively oriented that way, but we do use the abstractions of, of phonetics because it helps tune the ear and there are different ways you can use that on the course. So in long and short of it is, we do have embodied practice at the core, but there are times because it's an academic course when we're teaching you how to research, we're teaching you how to, um, apply phonetics to to coaching where there are sit down discussion lecture modes i would say the predominance is the former the body the body mind root <laughs> rather than mind uh, first so it it the best thing is to get a, a flavor from a current student who's kind of come from 
somewhere, uh, you know, in their education and, and is facing this mix. It, it's all very well for me to say, yeah, it's embodied mix, but, you know, um, for others, it may be a little bit, you know, more sit down than they ever thought. Um, it, just helpfully to, to tell you, there's a kind of unit, which is called voice practice, which is the biggest unit on the course. And that does really mean doing it. <laughs> so it's a double unit and it means experiencing it, thinking about it, doing it, teaching it, feeling it, knowing who teaches it in the world. Um, and then we have a, a unit called pedagogy, which is also about doing it, which means, do you know how to teach? Can you be taught how to teach? Where are you going to go out in the drama schools or what sector do you want to go out into? So the doing of the doing is really important and it trains you um, almost as much as a sort of PG cert really, you know, gives you the kind of qualifications to go into studios and drama schools. Um, and then we've got a unit called phonetics, which leads into accent and dialect coaching. And then we have a unit called research, which takes up practice as research is one of the key things at Central. How can you be a practitioner in an embodied practice? So it really does address um, the student who's interested in <laughs> learning by their, their felt experience and, and the movement of their body in the space because voice is in the body. So um, it's a mix, but I think the predomination is predominant mode is practice. Does that help? And Jane, oh, thank you, yeah. Jane, I, I was just going to add on to that, Jane. You, you yeah, touched yeah. on it in your answer there, but um, yeah. what kind of prior experience stroke, prior work backgrounds do people come onto the course from? Because from my experience, it's quite varied, isn't it? It is. Brilliant question. And I think that helps you to, my answer should help position um, yourselves in that. So, for example, on the course at the moment, we have someone who's already, interestingly enough, pretty much retired as a, as a, as a worldwide um, journalist, a correspondent, dealing with the voice and dealing with the news and dealing with, you know, that is certainly the voice has been central to her career and, and has also been interested in the arts and had experience of, you know, verse speaking and theatre practice. Now, she's not trained as an actor, but she's had a career where voice has been central. Match that against another student, he's come over from... United States, where he's been um, an actor, he's trained in music theatre practice, he's interested in doing his PhD and moving forward because he's putting together the practice he's had as an artist together with social um, justice concerns that are coming up, uh, which I alluded to in, in my introduction. So a lot of people are using arts-based practices in terms of um, gearing themselves towards sort of social transformation and social justice and you know how we how that's done is is um certainly open for experimentation and, and development because it's it's not there's an absolute track to it but you know for for myself i've used um arts-based practices and the training i've done with civil servants and business people over the years um because it makes certain certain things become much more apparent if the individual is um, put in an experiential environment where they're asked to to use themselves and experience themselves in relation to others. So it's much more relational in the arts and, and a lot of applica applicable training can, um, sorry, applications from that training can, can take place in lots of different career paths. So students may come from having been an actor, they may, and having been actor trained, or they've come from a linguistic university background in which they've also had an in, in interest say in literature or publishing I have a student at the moment who's doing audio who's done a lot with audio books but but had a more conventional university drama degree or arts degree and not actually done the kind of actor training that we allude to because it's what central does and which is sort of three-year conservatoire training and a lot of trainings don't happen at that length or duration anymore but that's still a model. It's a model of um, processual work in which you have year, three years to evolve yourself as a, as a performer. I know that's the CDT model, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of people maybe have had a year's course uh, of acting or done acting at school and then moved off into other departures, but always or kept their singing to the fore or certainly, you know, um, really community singing or professional singing. Um, which is probably a good point to say we don't uh, give you a professional qualification as a singing tutor, but we use singing to access the spoken voice um, 
and you as a person. Yeah. So I don't know if that gives you, Scott, or and everybody enough of sort of range of where people come from, opera, film, uh, voiceovers, communications, journalism. Yeah. No, thanks, Jane. I say sure. it because I, I remember a student from a couple of years ago who we interviewed for the prospectus, I think, and uh, I think he'd come from uh, international relations background in Canada, if I remember. Yeah. Right. Yes. Superb. I mean, that's a really good point, Scott, because I think a lot of um, a lot of degrees or prior previous degrees are about mediation and social um, justice in that side and really about how we communicate and how better communication can take place between individuals in which the body is important, the voice is important, you know, all of those signs and meanings that are about human being human. And um, this particular student has, was brilliant as a student and is continuing to be brilliant in his business design that he's put up. I don't think he's short of clients, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Good, so yeah, Maddie. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Mm. Yeah, um, so quite linked to the previous question, how uh, highly would you recommend teaching experience? So prior teaching, that's it. I think that's a really important point because although I'm saying you know there's both lots of different routes in it is important that you have some can demonstrate some interest or capacity to work with others I think that's probably the bottom and bottom line you know have you run small groups as a you know younger person for your peers have you paid attention to supporting one of your teachers by doing some sort of co-teaching it's, it's really manifesting an interest that you really want to put things on their feet in a studio classroom situation, studio classroom, training room, so that you manage you, your interest. It is how do you how do you work with the people in the room and how do you move them forward in a kind of trajectory to, to develop something? So that is the bottom line skill. And if you can at least demonstrate that you've got some experience, I mean, I'm I'm we can be flexible on that if if your other qualifications are sort of outstanding you know you've been acting for sort of 10 years and you um haven't done so much teaching but you have huge experience of the creative process as an actor so we weigh them up but i think it is safe to say that the bottom line is that you can demonstrate an interest or a capacity desire to work with other people in structured ways to moving them towards um progressive development yeah so yeah do get some experience if you can <laughs> yeah good questions really good questions yeah joanna yeah. i'll mute um yeah i was just wondering um it, how much things have changed because of covid um but both in terms of the course, whether any of the way the teaching is delivered has changed, although I appreciate that may be temporary, but also in the industry um, mm. and whether you, if, if things have changed, if you think that they'll go back. And also, it, also a brilliant question. And I'm sure many of you would like to know how the delivery is going. Um, we did, like everybody, have, have a hard time through the lockdown because this a degree, as you can imagine, really works well in person. <laughs> it works well because it's designed really around those actor training concepts of being together, feeling the vibrations, breathing together. Yeah. So being on on Zoom, uh, we had to reconfigure everything, and it wasn't always it wasn't always easy. But we did we did as well as we could because it's quite an intimate medium, Zoom, and we found all sorts of other ways of. That's just bringing some of those skills that we'd normally experience together, bringing them into the collective space of the Zoom gallery and using the breakout facilities, using all of the options for small groups. And in some ways, there were there were some things that we learned better um, and other things that just particularly the group experience. I think I can only underline that the group experience in the room is like no, no other. And that gives you information and sharing that. Um, doesn't happen in the same way on Zoom, but nevertheless, Zoom offered its advantages. And one of the key advantages uh, as the sort of curator and leader of the course is that we've been able to get wider access from our tutors across the world. So Zoom has kind of legitimized the fact that um, my global voice uh, unit that we brought in in order to expose 
uh, students to a greater range of practice outside of Western practice. And so just this next week, we've got um, a tutor who I've never met before, but was highly recommended from the University of Jamaica. And I really don't have the budget to pay for an airfare. <laughs> so, not at this time. Um, but, you know, we're going to have access to her wisdom and her practice, you know, and that's really made a huge difference to the curation of this unit, which which I would have thought about before, but not in the way that it seems to have just become best practice now that you can bring in a wider range of voices. And so that's been a real advantage. And at the moment, we are in um, pretty much full in-person delivery. It's just phonetics we've kept online because the tutor teaching it is working on a film set somewhere glorious, which I can't remember. She just always says she's somewhere wonderful. <laughs> and the fact that she's on a film set somewhere wonderful means she's not able to pop into Central on a Tuesday morning. So we also have her skills flying into us through Zoom. So there are advantages when it's it's hybrid and more disadvantages when it's it's the whole delivery. But we hope mm. and we hope, we really hope. I don't know, Scott, don't we? We hope it's not gonna get back to that again. Absolutely. I think yeah. um, I think there's a universal uh, desire mm. for uh, in-person, uh, you know, at, at, at full capacity. I think um, it's worth saying that um, we're one of the very few, if not the only drama school that has um, some still quite, not, not strict, but we have restrictions on access to campus at yeah. the moment. So every staff and student uh, needs to show uh, proof of a negative lateral flow test from the last 72 hours, um, masks obviously in corridors. And, and, I, and I mention that because of our desire for things to be in person. And obviously, as you can imagine, that group setting that Jane talks about is absolutely crucial. And one positive case at the moment can be, you know, it can change things. And so, so we, 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 we are taking a cautious approach and that's notwithstanding the fact that obviously for some people, coming out of the lockdowns and that that was actually very you know not easy to suddenly make that change so we tried as a school to to make the decisions that we feel hit, hit the balance best um and it seemed and as jane says there's been some some positives obviously we, we cannot wait for things to go back to normal and we hope that'll be uh, very much sooner uh, rather than later um yeah thanks scott yeah definitely fingers crossed all around so, Joanna, does that give you a better idea of kind of the circumstances at the moment and, and settle your mind on that? Yes, definitely. Has, has it changed the um, structure of the day at all, having bits on Zoom and bits in person or not particularly because um, it's only been the phonetics? No, I, yeah, I've had to do a fair bit of fiddling around. <laughs> um, if you're arranging for a Zoom, you suddenly realise, OK, that's very accessible. And if you schedule something five minutes after it in person, <laughs> but mm. it's impossible. So there, there have been logistic logistic challenges, but um, that's just the way it is. You know, I, I sometimes forget myself that I'm here in Brighton and I, if I schedule something in London, it does take two hours to actually get there. So this is just from modality and temporality. You're dealing with time, actually. But yeah. um, on the whole, uh, we've just had to renegotiate. And like everybody, you know, what's real time and what's Zoom time is quite different, isn't it? <laughs> yeah how are we doing anything else that anything anybody wants to share just to, even if yeah there's a there saw a hand flash up there ah georgia hello uh, sorry Hi. about the setting i've just run from a rehearsal it might be a bit weird sounding oh, no um, worries. But, um i've come from uh the eta course the rose Bruford, so it's very, very like devising creation-y kind of background. I'm wondering if there's any focus on using the voices at all and like a stimulus for creation. Yeah, you know, that's that's a wonderful thought. Um, voice improvisation, voice is the agent for space making. I mean, there's so there's endless opportunities for you to do that on the course, particularly if you're doing um, research with and collaboration with your colleagues, which of course we do train you to be a researcher. And then you might make that the object of your particular sustained independent project and I'm urging people to make that project not just a written project but also something that is an artifact there a video or an audio podcast or whatever so we're really looking to ensure because we're it's central because it's got the um the creative process at the core the more creative um we can think about the voice 
and its agency in the world as a creative tool, the better. So there's no um, limit on that. And if you come with that interest, it's very likely we'll will build something around it and, and utilize it. There are, you know, there are, as I said, in voice practice, which is one of the biggest units, there are numbers of ways of experiencing the voice in, the, in those units. And um, improvisation is something that Frankie Armstrong, for example, she's a singing practitioner coming next week. And I just saw the byline. She said, yeah, is it okay if we do, um, what did she say, rewilding the voice and improvisation and play I said yeah that's absolutely fine <laughs> that's just what what will be in order but you know it's not not every tutor faces it like you know gives you that interface other tutors will have other conventions and other practices and lineages you know whereas some of the lineages and voice have been quite sort of you know conventional and quite uh, delivering certain kinds of knowledge and you know I'm hoping that we can challenge that but also bring it forward into the new world if you like not throw everything out but you know say what does a what does a practice that's been around for for many years in drama schools how can we look at that afresh how can we build on that knowledge and um, build on your own expertise as you are inside your own voices after all and that is knowledge yeah so I hope that that helps yeah that's great thank you so much yeah pleasure pleasure yeah Oh, sorry, you actually have one more. Okay, go, go for it, Georgia, and then we'll um, hear I'm from I'm just Aiden. wondering, um, just practically, like, about the timetable, just how is that? Like, how many days a week, how many hours, like, contact hours, I mean? Yeah, good. So, timetable-wise, we have um, an induction timetable that is the autumn. In other words, it, it sets out all the, the basic um, skills, or I suppose, and the learning, the learning tools are there. And that's a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. And it, we do rather say, well, think of it like a, a training program that you would have had as an actor. <laughs> so you're in at nine and still there at six. But actually, if that's the most outer extreme, it won't always be like that. But we, we'd like to capture your time on four days in the autumn and three days a week in the spring and the summer. But don't think it just ends there because in the spring and summer, you're also out on the placement in both, both terms. So we suggest if you come and you can immerse yourself in the course, obviously you get a greater return of experience. Um, and so if you can, and I know it's difficult because students have to keep their day jobs going and their family lives and their personal commitments, but um, because it isn't a part-time course for the reasons um, that we've, we've kept it full time because everybody gets the experience of the, the contact with the range of speakers and practitioners across the world. So if we if we spread that into part time, it, we just couldn't we just couldn't afford it, to be honest, to, to keep that range of, of quality. So it's capturing your time four days a week, nine to nine to six, three days a week, spring, summer, nine to six. And there is wiggle room within that um, to to keep your life going <laughs> but it just to give you the up that front story that it's it's pretty full on yeah does that answer that yeah amazing thank you sorry for putting it cool cool alien then i know you wanted to to speak to us hi hi so much. Uh, i already have a phd on performance studies mm -hmm. and yeah and I also good for you. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It, it, it took me eight years. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and uh, I'm also a, a healer. I'm into uh, healing modalities, mm -hmm. and I develop uh, a modality um, <clears throat> that brings together scientific theory and also spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. And there is a very uh, important relation between. Um, healing and voice yeah as you know from like singing mantras and chanting and so on mm -hmm. uh, they're very effective on healing mm -hmm. so uh, I, uh, my interest in this course is about this topic yeah um so uh, i couldn't like find like a, a curriculum of the courses uh, but um I was wondering if I could like find something in this program that will like uh, broaden my understanding of the relation 
of voice and like creation and its healing power if the program will allow me to like make a research on this and also would i be like um able to find the power of my own voice discover my voice because i think it's something to discover and to that something that evolves in itself and uh, i realized like uh, uh, when i like evolve spiritually my voice also changes yeah huh? wow. Wonder, wonder, wonderful thank you for laying out those your experience and i mean because you've done a phd you would be very used to kind of a lot of the things that we actually do on the course which is to train people to be researchers so in one sense there is huge space for that relationship between the medical and the, the therapeutic and the healing because anybody can come and make those connections in terms of the knowledge that's out there, the knowledge that's aesthetic or um, esoteric, or where does our knowledge come from? And I think the course is very much about exposing us to the knowledges that we have and the knowledges we can put together to create other knowledges. So your PhD will, will no doubt have taken you down that road. And you may find that the MA, um, because it's sort of requiring you to go through certain units to get the credits, um, you might want to jump over those, but it's so in, in one way, the MA might not be quite the place for you to do that. If it depends, if you want to, to go through the, the, the basic training routes that it offers, when the time you get to the research unit in the summer, you'd be flying, but it's about really considering whether you want to go through the training process with a group of other individuals who may not have the same interests as you, but who would also give you something that perhaps you didn't know you were going to find, you know, in terms of collaboration and peer peer knowledge, as well as the knowledges of the practitioners we bring. So it's it's a really interesting question that, and maybe we should have um, you know, um, a one to one about that, whether it's appropriate, and I could go into more detail about yeah, where, you, so where it might be useful. Yeah, so do do get in touch about that. Okay, how will I get in touch by email? Um, yeah, by email. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, Jane, Jane's email will be uh, on the central website uh, on her on her staff profile. All right, thank you, thank you. I'd be so very much. happy to offer offer questions and answers about thank that. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Jane, I've had a, a question in the chat come yeah. through. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, we'd like to know more on the dissertation for the yeah. for the the MA uh, voice course. How easy or difficult is it for students to choose a topic and uh, complete it on time? Oh, right. Brilliant. Well, you could ask my students at the moment. So they came in thinking, oh, I've got to have my topic already. I said, no, no wait, it's fine. Um, you've got a whole three terms and we teach you how to think about the voice and the topic you might want to choose. And in fact, you may end up at the end of the three terms with an entirely different topic than the one you thought you wanted to look at. So that's the beauty of, of the course in one sense. It, it sort of opens different horizons, um, but you can also, it also can confirm your interest, the, the interest you come in with, maybe the interest you stay with. But in answer, the um, dissertation, which implies a written piece, piece, is not necessarily the only route. And I mentioned it earlier, you can split it in two. You can frame your practice and put it into a video performance. Uh, many, we had a beautiful piece of work last year. Um, an actor came in and did a piece about her voice in dialogue with herself and the voice and um, uh, about decolonizing, how she needed to feel, be decolonized and decentering whiteness through her own identity. And it was an amazing piece of work. And so that, that used um, the creativity, and she submitted, she did a performance and filmed it and submitted that as part of her final sustained independent project. Half of it is about 20 minutes worth of, 20, 25 minutes worth of video or film, and um, half of it about 7,000 words to frame that piece of work. So students, I've never had, there's never been a student to my knowledge who hasn't managed that because we build in the support to, to learn how to frame your SIP question. We build in performing research as a unit, which happens in the spring term. So you will learn about how to collaborate, how to frame voice in such a way that you can all find evidence, evidences for that. Um, 
So to my knowledge, the only reason somebody uh, might not have completed their dissertation is due to personal circumstances that have meant they've had to take a break from the course at that point. So I'm not sure if that's covered everything, but I, I really am urging students to, to be free and take the creative option of representing their work in, um, you know, video, film, filmic, digital representations, as well as the word. Great. And it's also worth saying at this point mm -hmm. that at Central, we have a, a really strong learning skills uh, program as well, which uh, offers really great uh, support for things like referencing and, and, and writing and academic writing and things like that. So it's just something to, to throw into the mix as well so that people are aware of that. It's brilliant. Thanks for saying that, Scott, because we do find that a lot of um, applicants and um, students on voice studies are not necessarily traditional based academic learners to the core. I mean, it's yeah, everybody's got there and manages to write an essay, but perhaps choosing voice for the very reason that it is embodied, it is um, uh, something that is felt uh, rather than just a strictly cognitive based uh, subject. So you find when you get on the course that you think, oh, I come here because I want to be part of an experience, but I just need some support in structuring um, and framing my work. So that's exactly what Central does. Masses of brilliant department actually um, to support. So, yeah. Yeah, I really would uh, encourage people to, uh, on our website, to look up the support services at Central. We've got, so we've got a real wealth as well. It's something something I think we're really, really good at actually. And, um, you know, from our um, on-site counselling service through to our student advice service, you know, there's a real wealth of support, both academic and non-academic, um, to really support you and just allow you to focus on what you're what you're at Central for in, in so many ways, which is, of course, the training. So I think it's uh, definitely something to, to have a look at. And just adding to that, Scott, the dyslexia and dyspraxia unit is, is phenomenal and um, has made a huge, huge difference to many students' experience going through this course and to their outcomes, which are usually, usually excellent. Yeah. Yeah, Nell. Hi. Um, Hi. I was just wondering about how large the group sizes are in the classes and how many people do you take on for each year? Yeah, good question. Um, I take between uh, 16 and 20 max. Try to keep an even number so that we can work in pairs, doesn't always work out. <laughs> but, um, and that's appropriate for the studio size rooms that we have and keeps the balance. I think we have, is it overall about 1,000, uh, sorry, 1,000 plus students at Central? Got, yeah. yeah, it's it's just over a thousand. That that yeah, covers yeah. all of our undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD students. So it's yeah. a it's a it's a it's it, we're quite large for a conservatoire, but uh, also yeah. well sized on each of the courses. Yeah. So the voice studies within that tends to have a, a healthy representation of about um, between sixteen. Usually, actually, it's it's more like eighteen to twenty. Yeah. Thoughts, ruminations, questions, Bill, Joanna, sure. Um, just a question about how the placements work, um, mm. and how they're decided. Sure, good, good point. So placements take place in and around the drama schools of the M25 um, and of further afield if you if you're able and interested to get to get to them, the Royal Scottish or the Royal Welsh Academies. Um, so we do it together. We do it, we, we, we send out a student um, area of interest form um, and the placements officer is fabulous at Central. They're on it and they'll send that form out to you. And then together with me, with the placement officer and your interest form filled out beautifully, such as you can't leave your dog at home on a Wednesday, please. Or you, you know, we need to know what you can and can't do um, within reason and we, we try to give you your first or second choice. Um, we don't throw you out there to the wolves. We really make sure that uh, we suit you to the place and your skill set and your interest. And we can't underline firmly enough how important the placement is to your 
your connections to the world and to <laughs> how it gives you a pathway through, gives you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, networking opportunities. It's fabulous. Just your relationship with the host can be very formative and, and structurally important. So um, together we will endeavor to get you with the placement officer and myself in, endeavor to get you in your appropriate place to, to kick off your spring term placement. And the same process applies for the uh, summer term where you have another opportunity, <clears throat> you can go somewhere else. So we take it at very much on, on a case by case basis. Um, and we do try to ensure that all our, our placement hosts are given the right kind of um, input, you know, we, we honour them and we value them. It's a huge part of what we do at Central, isn't it, Scott? This kind of placement host. Um, uh, we, we can't send someone who's not ready or doesn't feel right. So we really try to get the matching as, as, as suitable as we can. And are all the placements in drama schools or would some of them be in theatres, for example? We try to serve the main, main drama schools because they, we are a quality benchmark for them. So we fill the drama schools, the drama training within universities, say Northampton University, the adult education set, City University, City Lit, excuse me, Metropolitan University, the sort of all the universities that have drama departments within sort of M25, the drama schools themselves, um, and then any production work that comes across my desk that comes from small theatres or TIE or something. Um, and particularly the work that goes on at Central, there's masses of opportunities for that, and the work that happens in business um, training, um, sometimes there's opportunities come up as well. So we cover a range of sectors and more that you can bring if you've got contacts and um, places you'd like to work, we can open up those opportunities in tandem with the host, um, with the placement officer. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Okay. I often think it says that speaks a lot in the fact that uh, central uh, voice study students are, are training the actors and the performers at the other drama schools. I think it says a lot about our place in uh, yeah. in the ecosystem, if you will. Yeah, yeah, we really, we really respect that and really value it, and we do everything we can to ensure that um, we're on the same page with the same with the values that are important about training in this current climate and being true to our principles and making sure that any teacher that we send is going to be able to navigate their way with a range of client groups in those drama schools and elsewhere yeah any final question before we we close the session um obviously uh, it goes without saying that if you do, and this happens all the time to me, uh, we end the session, you then think, oh, I wish I'd asked that. Do do email us, please do. Um, it's so important we have all of the information that, that you want and you need in order to make informed decisions on, on kind of your, your next step. Um, one, one, one question I'll, I'll, I'll throw out there. Um, when is, and, and I don't know, people might be thinking this, they might not be. Jane, when's the best time to apply? Well, as soon as possible, in the sense we're, we're starting um, early December. That's the realism. Um, we're trying, I'm trying to get a mix of in person for those in the UK uh, and online for international applications. So it is best to get in as soon as possible because I make offers on, on rounds as we see them. Um, and certainly we'll be making offers on this side of Christmas if the applicants are appropriate. So it's, you know, I start, we start to put people together with people, try to think of the cohort, how the cohort skill sets will balance up. Um, they can't know all that material, but what's in, what presents is um, trying to get a, a very good mix of nationality and a professional background and of interest. So sooner rather than later is the best, is the best principle. I promise we didn't uh, stage manage that uh, question there at all. Uh, <laughs> obviously, people people apply at different times throughout the year. And, uh, there is a really important message there about, about applying when you feel ready to apply. I think that's the best answer. I think it's got yeah. yeah. But I think you're right, Jane. You know, we MA MA is di so, so much different from BAs because the timelines aren't there to mm. kind of give you guidance in a way. It's a very fluid process 
and you know we stop accepting applications when the course is full mm -hmm. and of course we don't know when that that will be so so it, yeah you're right jane it is in apply as soon as possible when and when you're ready okay it's kind of a combination of both i guess <laughs> no i think that's really good advice because i think i find that students who've tracked us for a number of years um they know when they're ready and that really makes you know it's like in hamlet the readiness is all you know that when when you're ready it really can take you can really take off with this kind of experience but if you if you're if you're a little back footed um and you haven't got everything lined up particularly about your know, domestic situation that you're really doing your best to organize things because it takes a lot of organization to to, to take a full-time you know postgraduate degree so the, the more prepared you are, I think that is probably the best answer, Scott, as you've just given. Um, but I give you the insider thought that, you know, I do do start um, start to make offers. So, yeah. The insider stuff is the stuff that we really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I will also mention, which I hope will be helpful, obviously, if you are um, based in England, then obviously there is the postgraduate loan uh, system, which you may have done some research. If you haven't, I would encourage you to look at that. And the other thing just to mention is around our own scholarships and bursaries. We do have uh, a number of them. Um, we're just literally in the process of updating the website at the moment uh, with the what what so far will be available for 22, 23, but uh, that will not be an exhaustive list by any means. Um, but just so you've got context again around when to apply, the way in which that works is that if you are holding an offer from us, i.e. we have offered you a place on the course, by somewhere around the 25th, 26th of April, then that's when the first call out for applications to scholarships will go out. If you are made an offer by us after that time, then everyone who's made an offer across the BAs, the MAs, everything, um, there's another call out in August. Now it's not to worry about that if you're in the second call out because we deliberately only give out kind of like half or so uh, of the scholarship settings. So it is still a fair process and there's still lots left. But it hopefully that just helps in terms of timing and tracking your the time of your applications. I'm sure everyone will want to um, apply for uh, scholarships and bursaries. And in fact, I'd encourage people to apply for them because you know um, even if you are unsuccessful in getting one, um, it is better to to apply for one. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Georgia. <clears throat> um, what's taken into consideration when you're choosing who would get the scholarships and whatnot? Yeah, it's it, it's a mixture, to be honest with you, of merit and hardship. But again, that will be dependent on the on the scholarship itself. So we've obviously got uh, our biggest pot is the MC scholarship, which is uh, a pot the school provides, which again is a mixture of merit and, and hardship. Um, but we do also fundraise externally for certain awards, uh, which really do vary. Um, and the, the, the people who donate the awards, they may specify whether it is specific, specifically merit or uh, financial hardship. Uh, and then there's a couple of others, isn't there, Jane? Uh, the Levy Hume uh, scholarships come to yeah. mind yeah. as well. We've just, um, I don't know if whether we'll continue this, but of course the um, alumni and engagement office is always working with potential donors. And we've just had the fortune of um, an accent and dialect coach uh, has donated to us in order to make sure that a student can get through their hardship, financial hardship. So things do come and things do go, some things remain and we hope we'll sustain that through another year. So, yeah. yeah. So it is a mixture, um, and the good thing is, that I, 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 the way I, I believe it works is um, you put one application in, we, we do kind of um, uh, consider you for all the things by which you're eligible for. So um, that's a useful, that's useful. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to everybody and your questions and being here, and I hope that We've, we've covered many of the bases that matter to you. And if we haven't, as Scott said, please do get in touch. And uh, we're just really grateful that you've come and uh, it, have an interest in us. That's the great thing. <laughs> really great. Yeah, thanks ever, ever so much for, for your time. I know everyone's leading yeah. very busy lives. And uh, yeah. as, as Jane says, hopefully that is a useful insight and uh, yeah, engage with us more, absolutely engage with us more. And then, uh, Obviously, I'm sure Jane looks forward to interview and seeing everyone again. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Roll them in. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.